Hello and welcome to my guest today, Sammy. Hey Sammy, do you want to introduce yourself? Do you want to? So, uh, hi. <laughs> um, so I guess music has just always been a part of my life. I've pretty much as soon as I could talk, I've been singing. Um, it's a big, big part of my family. And then that's what I studied at college and university and kind of realised that I guess the events management side was the thing that I was most passionate about. Um, and it's quite difficult to get into and singing and music is always going to be there for me. I think I'm going to be performing until the day I die. Um, but yeah, it's just such a big part of my life and always has been. Amazing. That's cool. I love that. Um, so how did you, I guess it's kind of a two-tiered question. So how did you get into singing? Um, I know your mum was probably an influence there. And also, how did you end up getting into events management and, and your music course and stuff like that? Yeah, so my mum, like you said, is such a big inspiration and influence in my life. She's um, So she used to sing when she was younger. And then um, she used to tell me when um, she was in her 20s, she sang at a friend's wedding and there was a drunk family member there who told her that she was awful. Oh. So she always, so she just gave up singing. Ooh. And then when I was born and she would always sing in the car she always tells this story every time you perform <laughs> and um we were in the car once and I was about three or four and I said to her mummy when you sing you make my heart melt oh <laughs> which is sickly sweet but That's that sweet. kind of it kicked her back off you know being able to sing and feeling comfortable because kids are brutally honest aren't they yeah. so um and I know I'm biased because she's my mum <laughs> but um then she started running her own choir and my dad always used to play guitar. Oh yeah. Um, so it'd always be my dad and brother playing guitar and me and my mum singing. So I think the first recording of me was when I was probably about four or five years old singing um, singing a hymn. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we still have it somewhere, but it's just always been any time there was a chance for me to perform or for me to listen to my mum record and stuff because my dad used to record it, mix and master it as well. So that's just always been, I guess, how growing up with my dad, he has MS. So going out all the time and doing things weren't um, always feasible, but being at home and making music together always was. So, yeah. and that was just always a big, big part of us growing up. Um, and it is more singing from like passion and feeling the music rather than like trying to read the music and work it out that way. Um, and I just, I never really found school something that I was comfortable with. I didn't really like being in that type of education because it wasn't the way I learned. And then when I was in high school, um, my head of the year said to me, why are you applying to do your A-levels and science and history, what are you doing? You love music, go and study that. So I did music tech at college, um, which was amazing. I had never been around that many musicians who were A, super talented, a lot more knowledgeable than I was about music production and music theory. Um, and whilst I was at um, college doing music tech, the event manager for the Black Eyed Peas, their tour manager came in. Oh, wow. And he was telling us everything that they had to do. And I was just mm -hmm. hanging on his every word. And I, because the big thing for me was I always loved performing, but I always loved having part of like the, oh, this thing is going on at this time. And the venue needs to look like this. And when we were in the recording studio, I was more, more of a producer telling people what to do. <laughs> so when I was like, oh, wait, there's a job that I can actually like have a good outcome, but tell other people what to do and do all the organization <laughs> of it. I was like, yeah that that's what I want to do <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the dream for you yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome no I like that um I really like what you said about you know music being something that you guys that your family did for pa like it was a passionate thing not trying to be necessarily oh we're amazing or we're gonna try and get famous just like this is what we like to do together yeah, it definitely wasn't ever like a, my mum has never been like a stage mum and be like, go on and perform. It'd always be like, you couldn't stop me from trying to, even as for like taking that microphone and wanting to get up and even in church being like, I'm singing a hymn for everyone today. Uh, <laughs> that's just always what we love doing. And I then love that. I love that you had that confidence. 
yeah I mean I think that's something that um I always think confidence like that isn't necessarily something that you can't teach because it's not that I don't get nerves but I've just grown up around people who are just as comfortable speaking one-on-one as they are holding a microphone in front of other people so I guess because I've done it since I was a toddler it's just always something that comes natural to me which is good for when I mess up because I'm like oh sorry let's start again Uh, that doesn't phase me no yeah that's good yeah messing up and letting it um shake you can always be a killing thing yeah um especially when it's being recorded yeah yeah the moment the moment that red light goes on and it's recording I mess up I don't know I don't care how well I know that song me too. <laughs> me too especially in a studio like on stage, out, I'm not yeah. yeah oh yeah you can, you can get away with it on stage especially if it's like like me in a band if there's a mess up you probably won't even notice it generally yeah you just keep yeah. going but yeah once yeah. you've messed up in the studio <laughs> it's so painfully obvious like, yeah stop stop again <laughs> cool so I want to talk to you about um, the gender balance in like your, like your music production course and any music related jobs or events jobs that you've done. Let's talk about what dynamic was yeah. there. So college and uni, there was an obvious thing, especially going from an all girls high school and uh me never really being around men to then going into college and it was just and so we started out on our so our course is split into two um but in my class we started out with three girls and there ended up with two and then in the other class there was only one um and that's how many sorry about 60 so it wasn't a lot um but I would also say that the girls who were on the course as well the ones who left were definitely more girly and the ones who stayed were definitely a little bit more tomboy and able to kind of take the banter from the men yeah um and I guess for me when I was in college I never really felt the sexism I guess it never really was an issue for us because there were any a few girls and we were all singers and everybody wants a girl singer on their in their band because especially if there was already a guy because you can do better harmonies and it yeah. was all I guess we were something different as well we were a different sound and you know if you want that type of sound then at least we're there and I guess we were all younger as well we were 15 16 um or 16 17 and it was just we were all friends really there were definitely times where there were things so if we were doing our live sound module and people would be like oh let me carry that amp and it's like a you shouldn't be carrying it on your own it's still Mm. too heavy for just you so Mm -hmm. like um like I remember I had one of the cheaters turn around and be like let us men do it and you sit there and look pretty and I know he was joking but it's it's one of those things isn't it yeah it's one of those comments that men think that they they play full way but when you're actually trying to do the same thing as the men you're like let me just carry it come on like yeah I yeah would carry it if you weren't here so <laughs> um but then uni that was the time where um because I guess also in college we're all from the same place like we're all scousers there's not much of a cultural difference and mm. then going to uni in the midlands where there was a lot more southerners a lot more people from the midlands a lot of people from further north than me um and I think that's when you notice the difference because everybody's been raised differently, I guess. Yeah. And there was men who, def- I mean, I think we spoke about it before, where they were like, uh, sit down and let the men talk. So I'll be like, well, forget well, you, then I can go do it my on my own. Yeah. Do it better. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> oh, I hate that. Disgusting. I can understand to a degree with live sound things, carrying equipment or whatever. If you have like a six and a half foot guy who goes to the gym or something, it's, you know, (laughs) just get him to carry it. So I get that. But when it's to do with like actually making a track or writing something, it's like your, your isn't any better than mine or your ability to create a song isn't any different from mine just because of what is between your legs. (laughs) No, exactly. yeah, I think I definitely saw it more then. But then at the same time, I also had tutors with events management who were telling me, honestly, you're going to have to work harder, but you're more than capable, but you will have to push harder than the men. So I guess I, I kind of appreciated the heads up 
yeah. with that. Yeah, it's good to know. Well, I mean, obviously you kind of know anyway, but it, it's good to know what you're getting yourself in for. But the fact that they warned you because they had faith in you. Yeah. And that's reassuring. I think it's just something that no matter what industry you're in or no matter what you're doing, it doesn't even have to be work. You're aware that we may have to do twice as much work to be noticed. And mm. it is getting better. And I guess it depends on the part of the industry you go in. Like my mum, because she runs a choir and everything that she's done is she very, very rarely, rarely interacts with men. It's mostly women that she works with. So the part of the industry that she sees and that I get a glimpse into is really uplifting, empowering and inspiring. Uh, she did say that uh, you can uh, call her if you want to Ooh, talk yeah. about it because I think it would be it's a good perspective because I think sometimes we can maybe feel a little bit negative because that's what we experience but when you see that there's um other women and like they're part of like communities for women in music women in business and everything like that we don't really get to see that part because we're not going to those networking things so whenever I get a chance to go or um (laughs) see mum working with people like um like sense of sound who was singing would take that and Lulu and giving her the opportunity just because she's another woman in the industry is like yes Yes, that's excellent solidarity (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's cool yeah um you might have to shoot me your mum's info and I'll see if I if I can arrange something with her because that would be really interesting to hear her perspective on stuff yeah because she's also because she's running a business in it as well um she does go to all the networking things for just people in business in Liverpool and how the collaboration I think I think maybe when you get to a certain level of success you don't see that because people have that respect for what you built yeah but you have to if you're going into the industry the way that we are you have to fight all of that before you get that respect Mm. so I think that's the difference between me and my mum is she automatically had the respect because she worked really hard and grafted and did all of that and then so when people were seeing the outcomes they were like oh well look at this whereas I'm like please just give me a job but don't, <laughs> don't give it to the man who has less qualifications than me <laughs> promise my band is just as good <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, That kind of leads me into my next question, actually, which is about women in your life who have been role models and encouraged your interest in music. So obviously your mum was one. Yeah, my mum's one. And, um, you know, people like Emily um, definitely are because she is so incredible at what she does. Um, And I always say to her, she's... Emily's got a very unique brain and she has a different perspective, I think, on life and the world than the rest of us do. So her outcome in her work is always really unique, Mm. which I think is rare. And she goes for jobs and goes for things in a different avenue than I think other people would. Like she'll do little independent things like working with Pinewood and One Born Every Minute and stuff like that. Whereas I think people will be like, oh, I want to go work for this company to work my way up for that. Yeah. And I think she wants her like independent progression Mm. um which is really difficult to do um so I have a lot of respect for her because she's also you know like me she's done similar courses where there's all these men just talking in your ear and she finds it really easy just to zone that out and focus on the actual work whereas I find that a little bit more difficult to do because she'll just be like whatever I'll get on with it where I'm like actually no you're gonna watch what I do and watch me be better than you so I think I think that she's able to uh put that into actions more than I am and like Mm. an outcome but I think you're you're both doing two very needed things there where she's like I'm just gonna get on with it and let my work speak for itself and then you're just like no I'm gonna challenge this because otherwise they're gonna keep doing it and I think both of those things are very important to do <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and I and I, I think a lot of it comes down to background and what you're personally passionate about like if I see anyone being a bigot in every any way I'm gonna call you out on and or I'll call you out on it and educate you on it 
be like, well, this is why there's a gender bias. This is why women aren't respected in the industry. So yeah, maybe you want to think people, about what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes people actually don't realise mm-hmm. um, what the history or context behind certain things are. Some people yeah. like, won't even realise certain things are offensive and that's that's absolutely fine as long as they're willing to be like, oh, I didn't know, I'm sorry, I won't do it yeah. again. Then there yeah. are, obviously there are other people who are just doing it to be assholes, aren't there? Exactly. And I think one, maybe not necessarily music related, but she's, um, there's a woman called Linda McDermott and she's on BBC Radio Merseyside. Um, oh, yeah. And my mum has been on her radio show every week for Oh, just over a decade I think wow. um, and I get to go on with Linda and she is a woman working in the BBC on so BBC Radio Merseyside even though it's local <laughs> it's one of the most listened to um, shows on the BBC um, oh, wow. other than like Radio 1 and she's fought hard with you know, like all these male DJs and stuff because she's been doing it for I think maybe 40 years wow. and stuff and she is incredible at what she does she she doesn't need notes or anything but if you've met her once she will remember everything that you told her and then she'll be like how did this go and where are you up to now and her way of interviewing people and you know also engaging listeners and everything like that in such a calm way um is incredibly inspiring to me because being a dj in the bbc is a woman at at that period of time as well must have been incredible diff- incredibly difficult but she's done it for so long that again she has that respect now you know no one's going to knock mm. her off of that platform because she's been such a respected part of the BBC for so long yeah and she's not very well known um you know maybe outside of Liverpool or the northwest but um she does have listeners in Canada America everything like that who listen to her every single day just because she's incredible at what she does so and her work speaks for itself so she yeah. doesn't need to be like oh well I don't need a man to do this she's like well look at what I've done clearly I can do it <laughs> yeah exactly um yeah. I think people like that as well people who just make everybody that they interact with feel seen and remembered you garner like loyalty mm-hmm. through that so if anybody did want to try and challenge her or what she's achieved I'm sure you'd get plenty of people rallying to stand up with her her behind her etc to be like well no actually like she's earned this and she's she's good at what she does you know including men who will back her up on that and I think sometimes when we talk about this it's hard not to trash men because (laughs) it's also little microaggressions that you get throughout the day (laughs) and stuff like that um that that's why I think it'll be good if you speak to my mum because uh, she maybe doesn't have as much um, experience within the music industry of um, sexism. Definitely in her life, she's had that because I mean, <laughs> who hasn't? hasn't? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I so I do try and focus on like these are the incredible women that are in my life or. Um, even people in pop culture like Ariana Grande when she's asked anything sexist <laughs> yes like is that really what you think girls care about and I love that I love how many um I love how many women at the moment are just like shutting that down even like actresses and stuff are just like you didn't ask him that question <laughs> yeah yeah all, all well, of the I men get asked what they're wearing too like <laughs> yeah yeah no, I, I think there's come a point now where um a lot of a lot of women on every level are just like why are we still putting up with this exactly and I think that um I mean as as dark as it is I think the whole um Harvey Weinstein case and the whole me movement was such a big change for women ever because it was also always seen as a woman's shame yeah when it shouldn't be like that's a man's guilt not a woman's shame and if women can get up and talk about media moguls that big who are treated in that way then we can be like well pay me the same or don't talk to me like that yeah exactly. that. It, yeah it makes it easier to call them out on the little stuff and, I was gonna say if and, the big issues get called out then it trickles down doesn't it yeah and I, I have people at college who uh, sorry at uni who used to say to me Sam you don't need to call people out on everything and I'm like but I do though because they'll keep doing it 
Exactly. And like, if you're tired of me having a go at you, how tired do you think I am for having to hear it and it being aimed towards me all the time? That's if you don't want to hear it, don't say it. Exactly. <laughs> I was talking to Amy about something similar, actually. Um, we, I, we were saying like, if you don't call that stuff out or you feel bad for like calling out the little things, but they can so quickly snowball into the bigger things if you're, mm-hmm. if you're not careful yeah um it's also behaviors that I think that sometimes because it's just part of culture men don't realize how debilitating that that can actually be yeah absolutely I think a lot of the time it isn't even um purposeful Mm -hmm. yeah it's just but it's the same as um comments towards men like all man up like that could be really really damaging to men who are hiding stuff so I just think that it's I just think we're coming up to a time where there's a lot of conflict right now, but there's got to be a resolution in the way that we're living our lives. And, you know, men should be able to express themselves in a way, but also express themselves in a way that isn't detrimental to other people living their own life. Yeah. Yeah, there's too much... um, What's the word I'm looking for? Conditioning in men to yeah. kind of repress a lot of their emotions that aren't seen as manly. So pretty much mm-hmm. anything but stoicism or anger, a mm-hmm. man isn't allowed to feel. And it's really damaging, not even not just for the man, for everybody who yeah. interacts with them as well. Yeah, because even down to like you teach kids from a little age, if a boy is pulling your hair, boys will be boys. So you're yeah. teaching the women, it's okay for a boy to be like that because he likes you and it's <coughs> teaching them, okay, it's okay for you to... It's okay a for a boy like to hurt that. you, is basically yeah. what I'm telling them, yeah, because he likes you. Yeah. And then we wonder why women end up in domestic abusive relationships. Yeah. You told them yeah. that and a boy I, hurting them meant that he liked her, so what do you expect her to do? Yeah, and I I think it's going to be a a long way to change. But, you know, just seeing where our grandparents were, like, women couldn't even work, and if they did, they were a secretary Mm. and stuff. And, like, now we're at a point where it's, like, a lot of women don't want to get married and don't want to have kids, and they're not being ridiculed for that because they want to have a career and stuff. So it's slowly changing, but there's still a long way to go. Do you know what? That reminds me. (laughs) Um, of something I saw the other day which was about um, like you said um, women back in I don't know how long ago but um, I think it was a discussion of why like our grandparents and stuff didn't get divorced as often as our generations or the generation just before us and somebody pointed out like women couldn't have their own bank accounts until like I don't know what year it was. I'm going to look it up. Um, Women couldn't have their own. (laughs) I find these, I find so many like great things. I'm like, yeah, that's amazing. Can't remember it. Couldn't have. Especially dates and stuff. Yeah, I'm awful with dates. I like, I think history is so interesting, but I never took it because I'm bad with dates. Um, Uh, So yeah, I I took (laughs) history and loved it, but I was awful with dates. I'm like sometime around, during the war at some point it's happened. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> um, I know they weren't allowed to vote. Oh, so the maybe the sixties? Yeah, it can't have been that late, surely. No, it makes maybe sense. It was wow. Yeah, because that's the thing is that I think that um, you know every generation that goes on and <coughs> social media is um, good justice as it is bad yeah. but that is given um you know minorities more of a platform to a interact with you yeah. like I know that growing up when when like my space was a thing and stuff and oh being God, able to communicate space. with people that are on the other side of the world but they're a similar age to me and they're thinking of coming out and they don't really know how to process it and you're talking to this complete stranger who's going the same thing and that helps with your own progression and yeah it, social media is a platform to call people out on stuff as well as it's just as much as a place it is to post bigotry but yeah um but I think it, it I think it gets easier because even now you see videos of like 
teenagers, um, especially like around Thanksgiving, who are calling out the parents for voting for Trump being like, so I saw one video of a girl saying to her dad, oh, I'm starting to see this guy, but he's got um, <clears throat> 27 allegations of some of sexual assault. And dad is like, what? No, you can't. And he's, she's like, they're just allegations. There's no proof. And he's like, I don't care. I don't care. And then she was like, oh, sorry, it's not a guy I'm seeing. That was Donald Trump. <laughs> he <passed> away. <laughs> And it's like, well, well done, because I, I don't think, you know, even when we were young, that we would call out our parents, mm. um, you know, voting for someone like that. And I think because kids have a phone now and you're able to see you know, the different points of view, I think that's making it a bit easier. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very Maybe proud. I'm very proud of what Gen Z have been doing with TikTok and stuff. By the way, they use TikTok yeah. to like book up his rallies so nobody went. Mm-hmm. One thing I like as well, it- speaking of Thanksgiving, sorry, is um, going back to giving mon- like minorities a platform is so many people are making it so much more visible um, about how Native Americans have been treated and Mm -hmm. how Thanksgiving is built on some real atrocities. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's a really, and again, another really positive thing that's come from social media. Again, it's just raising awareness for things like that. I think it's definitely, um, you know, social media for music as well, is a fantastic thing. You can put, yeah, anyone can make it now and anyone can put it out to many people and there's so much support on there. And I think it's, it's easy to get lost in lots of like Karen's going crazy um, and being like the world evil and just reading and seeing nothing but evil. But then you, um, I love going on YouTube, rabbit holes of people. Like I always start out with uh, people like Dodie because she is my. Oh, yeah, I love Dodie. Oh, my, I love her so my actual queen. Um, so but I always start there and then listen to like different women musicians on YouTube and then you follow them on their social media and beforehand artists would barely get paid anything and like I mean they still do but independent artists mm-hmm. who are putting their stuff out on YouTube I'm gonna buy you CD I'm gonna buy you vinyl I'm gonna buy the cassette I'm gonna buy the t-shirts <laughs> and stuff so it's such a there's obviously still you know, major record labels that aren't paying artists properly but you can support the small ones that you like um, yeah and again I think I think that's another great thing about um I guess the general public being kind of more aware of those things again because of social mm-hmm. media they'll they'll realize that maybe a lot of the artists that they like aren't getting as much money as they might have thought they were mm-hmm. so they will make the efforts to do the things they know make the money like buying merch and yeah and going to the shows and gigs. stuff yeah and I know that um like Beyonce and a few other people they made Idol and that was more expensive than Spotify but the artists were actually getting paid properly yeah. rather than getting paid a penny per song per stream yeah, it's, it's not um, even a penny <laughs> it's not even yeah, a penny no it's not it's not <laughs> but but that service was just so bad that I was like, this is more than Spotify and I want to support you, but it's not working. I'd rather so. just buy a CD or a T-shirt, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that, yeah, maybe I, has enough money. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'm like. If I listen to something on Spotify and I really like it, I will, as long as I can afford it at the time, obviously, I'll try and make an effort to buy a T-shirt or buy the CD or if I can, I'll go to a show because I mm-hmm. want to go to a show anyway. So yeah, hundred percent. I think yeah, because of partially because of social media, we are much more aware of how these things work now. So we yeah. make yeah, we make the effort to try and kind of streamline how we're gonna pay the artist, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Because <laughs> again, it is down to that thing, especially. Uh, so I ended up. I don't really like Kesha. But I ended up buying like a couple of like merch things from her just because of that whole court case thing and her being told yeah. that she had to work with somebody who is sexually assaulted, her, which I think is yeah, that was disgusting. It it was awful. I, I can't believe that that is something that happened in this day and age in a supposedly first world country. Yeah, uh, it's America. Yeah, <laughs> <But> well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really, but yeah, <laughs> that, that just shocked 
me because I think that was also I can't remember if it's just before or just after the whole Harvey Weinstein thing and I'm so surprised mm. that there has been a thing for I think it was around the time yeah because you know that that whole film and stuff you know that that's definitely happening to mm. women in the music industry and stuff and I me and Ed said a few times we're just waiting for maybe the Netflix documentary or something like that to come out because I know that I've been in situations before where someone's like oh do you want to record and I'll be like yeah and even on a small level someone's saying that they have their own recording studio and you go around and you do not feel comfortable Mm. and they've bigged it up and you're like all right okay you told me you have a studio but it's your dingy house that's in (laughs) this dodgy area maybe bye (laughs) and it's just you I think that we always have to look out for ourselves a lot more yeah whilst which is something that I think um men don't men don't necessarily have to think about like Mm -hmm. it's getting dark now and men don't have to think about oh am I gonna take like walk with my keys and my knuckle or like me and Emily only live 20 minutes away from each other 20 minute walk if that but if it's past 5 30 I get a taxi (coughs) now because it's it's just it's just not worth the risk and I think that it's like that in music is if you a big break you're like right okay what is the risk do I need either compromise who I am to make the music and look the way that they want me to because sometimes not to like toot my horn but sometimes I listen to some singers and I can sing better than that but I don't look the way that they want me to look I like me natural is the beginning of princess diaries (laughs) (laughs) Like before the makeover, <laughs> so I thought she looked good I before want... the makeover. <laughs> well, that gave me a lot of uh, that gave me a lot of like mental things growing up, being like, but that's how I look like, and mm. everybody hated it beforehand. So <laughs> I think the thing is as well, like it doesn't help that it's Anne Hathaway because it's hard to make Anne Hathaway look bad. Yeah. <laughs> it just is hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, but I think that's the thing that we have to always be aware of is like a man can get on a stage in a top that he's been wearing for four days jeans <laughs> with like paint all over them grubby nails and everyone would be like yes but if we got up on stage being like oh I just rolled out of bed people would be like oh my god she was okay but she was awful except Beyonce because really she woke up like this well yeah <laughs> that's because she's an actual queen <laughs> yeah um I was gonna say something actually going back to kind of combining two of your things there with like Kesha and having to be an artist that they've told you to be so I think a lot of like it's annoying because Kesha gets a lot of backlash for things like the auto-tune and the persona but Mm -hmm. I'm pretty certain that that was that producer's doing who was like you need to do this this and this to get people Mm -hmm. to listen because ever since she hasn't been doing that she's been doing a lot more like rock and country inspired stuff because her mum I believe is a country music writer as well oh, I, um, I think she wrote I think she wrote a song with for or with Dolly Parton I <gasps> don't quote me but do you know Old Flames uh no <laughs> it's a good one she did <laughs> she did a version of it um on the album that Kesha brought out when she was finally allowed to bring out music again I don't know exactly what the situation was with that but she, yeah, she did. Um, she's featured on that album. Her and Dolly sang that song, I think, because her mum had a hand in writing it. So I would recommend oh, that. It's very good. Yeah, definitely. And have you heard? Definitely. Did you hear this, the single that she brought out, "Praying," where she was basically like, "Yes, I can sing. Here's a whistle tone." <laughs> yeah, yeah, which I find amazing and kind of sad at the same time. Like the way that I look put me off doing music performance at college and uni was because I'm five foot nothing um I don't look white even I am I've got dark curly hair and glasses and you know I, I'm not what people want to go and look at when um unless a really dark bar. <laughs> but it's just it's one of the things where when you go into college and <coughs> I think it's a little bit different for people who are into creative industries when they're going to college and you something where you know that this is my career path even though we're still teenagers and other people may be doing English and maths and you know nothing wrong with that but that's not a a definitive career path 
And mm-hmm. um, so for me, I was like, oh, well, I love singing. That is my passion. And if I could do that all day, every day, I would. But realistically, no record label is going to pick me up because the way I look, they can't even mold me and see that they'd want me to look. So I said I could grow another foot and <laughs> bleach my skin and <laughs> put some blue contacts in. So that is something that like at a younger age was always like, a, oh, well, this is passion but you're not going to be able to do that because you don't look the right way so that's why I was like oh if I'm in events management I'm behind the scenes and I can still get that respect still do something that I love but the general population don't have to look at me (laughs) (laughs) well it's a shame really because I do think obviously you're correct those were totally like valid Um, but I do think it's changing a fair bit now I think there's a lot more I don't want to say a lot more diversity, but I think there's definitely some more diversity that we're seeing in pop artists, yeah. um, especially around like bo- body positivity stuff. It's just like, well, it doesn't matter what they look like. Lizzo. They can sing. Yeah, Lizzo, mm-hmm. Adele. I know Adele's lost a lot of weight recently, but, you know, people yeah. didn't really care because she had a fucking pipes, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I, th- I think it's also like the style of stuff I do is more um, ballady and stuff and when if a record label was like someone to do ballads then you know they're not going to be having like it's not going to be like little mix where they're dancing all the time and they can make it really poppy and have different visuals everywhere it's just about that person yeah. um so I think that's why I've always found it a little bit more difficult is because I, I've gone for um interviews and auditions and everything like I used to enter a lot of competitions when I was younger um and it's always weird the, the amount of times that you would get the comment of, oh, I wasn't expecting that from you. And I'm like, thank you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> like, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't I don't know how to take that. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know why there's a kind of perception of you have to look a certain way to be able to sing. I mean, like, yeah. remember like Susan Boyle and they were like, oh my God, she can sing. It's like, what does her appearance have to do with her vocal cords? Yeah. And I mean, I've been, so when the X Factor first started, my, the very, very first one, my mum went for an audition for it, but they were interviewing people. And I've been for auditions for Britain's Got Talent a couple of times. And um, the very first X Factor, this is like, um, pop idol was it like it was kind of big but it wasn't really really here and it didn't have that like definite like the audition rounds is to rip into people who think that they have talent and bully them yeah um, and then have the good ones and when I went for the audition I uh, can't remember what she sang it might be in New York State of Mind and my mum sounds beautiful singing that but one of the women who was in the audition in her group with her was this woman who was really really large she hadn't done a hair or anything and she had stains on a top and she wasn't the best at singing but she was a little bit like I am the best singer mm-hmm. and she ended up getting it in my mum so that was like the first thing where I was like right okay so they're catering this to who you, they can who they can rip apart on tv for entertainment yeah exactly yeah. and then I've I've been for interviews but auditions before for Britain's Got Talent as well where um I always think if I was to turn around and be like this is my sob story and I went on singing with my mum we would get on like that yeah but like I don't want to get on because like the only reason why I would get on I don't think I'll get into the finals or anything it's just because I love performing and singing in front of that many people and stuff would be an incredible feeling I wouldn't even care if they said yes or no and mm. um, it would just be the experience of it but I would want to get on because of my talent not because of my story mm. and yeah that's me the and mother always spoke about it and you know looking after my dad and like I'm starting her choir because she needed a she wanted to start a or find a singing group but it was always choirs <laughs> where you had to read music and everything and she just wanted like a community choir mm. and there wasn't one and she started it just because you know looking after my dad things were a bit difficult at home and you need that kind of respite yeah um and then that spiraled for 17 years of her doing this now and it's incredible but if we said that as our sub story of course we would get on because they'd have the choir that are paying for the tickets to go there and they'd have you know like good things to be able to film but yeah like 
we're good at what we do and we should be recognized for that not because of we've had a shit life <laughs> yeah no exactly yeah that's that's the big problem with um with stuff like x factor and britain's got talent like i absolutely you know i love little mix you know i think they're incredibly talented and i think you know they deserve to win but then there are others who are like you're in this competition yeah you're great you're talented but you got in because they knew it would be good tv yeah that's why i prefer the voice um yeah i just love all of the judges on the voice <laughs> tom jones is oh my gosh I doesn't he him. look great silver like and he sounds so good <laughs> yes he does so good <laughs> <laughs> uh he's one of those ones where like one of the mum crushes where I'm like, do you know what? I get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I would like to, I think I talked about this a bit with Emily as well. And we've talked about this a bit before in our older one, but I just think it'd be good to talk a little bit about working festivals and the gender stuff surrounding that. If there's anything specific surrounding that, um, I imagine it's another sort of, possibly sexist yeah, I, <laughs> environment yeah it's definitely sexist and I think when I so when we first started um we did it as a thing because we couldn't afford to go to a festival and we were like right we've worked on bars let's do this and then because we were working hard we very quickly got noticed by the management and they put us on as supervisors um and then by the next festival, we were on as cash supervisors. So literally just taking money out of tills, not serving anyone, not um, not looking after the staff or anything like that. It's literally just taking money out of tills and giving it to someone else. And we were a bit like, why would you, why when you've noticed that we're good at something, would you take us away from put us on something that's so simple? Mm. Um, but then what I kind of realised with that is sometimes you have to use the sexism to your advantage. Yep. And I realised that Freemans were getting more and more contracts for festivals that were bigger with more bars. So that meant that we were going to be able to be a cash manager and be on our own and we would get more money from it. And at the same time, having someone um, like the owner of the company um, respect you and trust you with that much money yeah. isn't necessarily a bad thing so even though we were put into a role because like the guys do stock and the guys run the bars and the girls do the cash it's like well that looks good on your cv exactly and it, it has like them moving us around in the business the where they place us is sexist but what they've actually done is notice that there's staff members out of hundreds of people they've noticed that we work hard for them and that we enjoy yeah. what we're doing and, and that they're trustworthy good. exactly and you know they've they paid for us to go down to Gloucester to do training mm -hmm. they trust us with training other staff they pay us more money they um you know we're friendly with them and we're we're like the only three or four people that aren't from Gloucester that they trust with the money so you know that's even though to start out with, it was like, well, I can do what the men do. It was like, well, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. But then there were, there were definite things where there was sexual harassment and not necessarily aimed towards, because me and Emily are people where we pick up on that kind of energy very quickly. Mm -hmm. And my thing is, is I will just, like we're at a festival, I'm going to wear the baggiest clothes, put my hair up, don't even look at me, don't think of touching <laughs> me. Like, and, and like the way that I talk to you. Don't even perceive a, me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not here. Like, I'm not here. Just I'm just a voice in it. your head telling you what to do and that is it. <laughs> yeah, because also the thing is, is I loved the job and the, I think mm. that's a hard thing for women when you really love what you're doing, but sometimes the environment is a little bit toxic. And yeah. I had to be like, well, if, one of them did something like that to me you guaranteed I'm taking them to court about it and you know then I, then I've lost my job for this what I do for like six months out of the year yeah and it's like so what we would end up doing is turn around to bar staff and basically warning them that or if we see that one of the bar managers was getting a bit too familiar we would kind of like buddy ourselves up and be like oh you're coming on cash now to like get away nice. from that yeah and yeah just put you know, yourself in between 
yeah and because the thing is also like I'm the type of person where it's like if you're gonna do something do it to me leave them alone because Mm -hmm. I'll have it out with you I think I'm (laughs) like especially because a lot of the now that we're a bit older a lot of the girls on the bar have just turned 18 and like I'm 27 now I feel like my duty it's the same way that if I'm working on a bar even if I'm not on I have pads tampons paracetamol ibuprofen whatever you need I have it there because there's nothing worse than not having that so yeah and I mean to be fair I think that there were complaints made and I think quite a lot of them went on a sexual harassment course and it stopped because I think that it's it's an environment where there's a lot of banter there's a lot of drinking people are on a lot of drugs both staff and customers um and the lines get kind of blurred yeah, and some girls will be okay far. yeah exactly and some of the girls are okay with getting that attention and people are like pretending that they're about to kiss them or pretending that they're about to grab them and other girls will be like paralyzed in fear not I was gonna say yeah if they're too scared to say anything yeah and, and, trapped and that's yeah and that's just not a good environment to work in and I think that there no. was I mean this is a while ago that it was like that the um you know and I would say the people who were like that don't work there anymore um but I think it was something where it is it shouldn't have taken a complaint for you to put that into your staff because your staff shouldn't be acting like that at the end of the day you're running a multi-million pound company and these people are not from the same background as you and you can't just go pick up a girl because you think it's playful flirting that's that's scary yeah it's it's not appropriate in a work environment either like no. it's not appropriate anyway but especially in a work environment yeah and I think it's um Freeman's has always been one of those jobs where that's taught me to have thick skin and how to have banter because you 99.9% of the time what they're saying is just banter Mm -hmm. and you have to let it go but there's definitely people I mean like I said I'm going to call people out if someone's saying something around me I turn around and be like shut up and be like (laughs) no and then if there's like a group of lads and they're all rounding each other up about that I'll embarrass every single one of them I I don't care because my thing is yeah well my thing is is if I embarrass you now (laughs) It may not change you like the second time, but the next time you do it, you're going to hear my voice in your head saying it. So eventually you'll get fed up with (laughs) That's my theory is because I will have a go at them for too long as well. People will be like, Sam, you need to stop now. And I'm like, no, I don't. No, it needs to stick. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. If I just have a go at them for a second and they'll easily brush that off and move on like nothing happened. No, no. They have to play the game for a long time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, because it's also my thing is as well at festivals, it's such a big turnaround of staff. Like, you can work on one bar on one day, and the next day you have a hundred new staff that you've never met before, yeah. And you don't know these people and their backgrounds or anything that's happened in their life, and they could have had the most simple life or they could have had horrific things happen. So, yeah, you just shouldn't, even if you know someone well enough and they're okay for you to be having that type of banter you shouldn't be doing it with people that you don't know no exactly yeah yeah but, it's it's absolutely one thing to do it with your friends who you mm-hmm. know you have more context with but being yeah. overly familiar with people you don't know is just a bit and, and like not right. even just like sexual jokes or anything like that but just even I don't know like being a bit you know like banter like just being a dick to somebody but like your friend knows you're joking doing that with somebody you don't know they don't necessarily know you're joking (laughs) yeah exactly and I'm shocked at the amount of men because I used to do it at uni because like I said it was all men yeah and I used to turn around to people and be like you know that saying that is sexual harassment and they're like no it's not and I'm like if a girl is telling you that that is sexual harassment even if you don't believe it it is I feel sexually harassed so (laughs) yeah if you like and I'm shocked at the amount of men that I've had to turn around and argue with about what is class of sexual harassment. And I think it's something that, you know, needs to be taught from a younger age. Like in the Netherlands, they teach um, sexual education at a much younger age. And obviously prostitutes are legal and stuff. And they have a much, much, because they're taught about consent as mm. well. Whereas we're not yeah. taught about what consent is here. Yeah, we um, that's so important to include yeah and because they're taught about that they have a better outlook on it they have less 
um, sexual crimes and stuff. And I, I think here it's a taboo mm. subject to talk about because it makes people feel uncomfortable and it isn't something that's nice. But unless it's taught properly and unless people are called out on it, it's not going to change. And, like, I've definitely known men in my life who their behaviour or the things that they've said is worrying and concerning Mm -hmm. and it's like this this person could very easily especially if people are drunk and he's with a girl that's drunk you know can very easily take control of the situation and because what a lot of men didn't realize as well that I've spoken to is that you shouldn't even if you're drunk and even if you've been drinking together all night don't sleep with them give consent if you're drunk yeah and they're like oh yeah but what if she's really into it and I'm like but tomorrow she might not be Mm. like and I think and I mean not saying that you know you should never go have sex when you're drunk and that all times it's not consensual yeah Yeah. Um, but it's just when you're at a certain point if you if you can't make those sensible decisions and it's not consent (laughs) yeah and it's just um I think I've just worked in a lot of environments where because I've worked in hospitality for so long and the music industry and you're around drinking, you're around drugs and you just see this type of thing happen a lot. Mm. Um, I think you're more aware of it, which I, I try and make it, try to make it not make me so cynical <laughs> about the world, but uh, sometimes it's hard not to be cynical about the world. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, especially in the year 2020. Yeah. Um. I was going to, I thought of a point when you said about um, like sex here being taboo and stuff. Do you think maybe, you know, we talked about how men are sort of taught to repress their emotions and stuff. And then that can lead to lashing out and shit like that. Do you think maybe it's a similar thing with like sex for them? I know like some of it is probably like entitlement and shit like that and not being taught consent. But also, you know, because it's something that we're kind of taught to repress. Yeah, 100%, because I think also, um, you know, it's that difference between, like, a man is, you know, like, a man is seen as good if he goes out and sleeps with a load of women and women are seen as sluts. And it's like... <laughs> so who's he sleeping with? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's, I think it's, especially when you're around university students and stuff like that and you know hormones are going crazy you've never been away from home you're around all these people and uh, like everyone's doing it um but I think that if you're not taught properly about the what it actually means and you're just going out and sleeping with whoever and not to say that I haven't also done that in the past as well and you know I'm not judging people who do but Mm. I think it's just maybe when you get a little bit older you realize more what you're doing and I think a lot of men it's easy and women use um sex as an excuse to kind of like escape from things Mm. yeah like a coping mechanism for sure yeah and I think um me and Clara have spoken about the fact that you know it used to be you would get married and then you have sex whereas now I don't think people even want to get into a relationship with someone that they haven't slept with uh people will be sleeping together for months before they get in a relationship yeah and I think that that sometimes takes away a lot of the boundaries for people especially when you're like sleeping with friends and you may have these walls up and people will be like oh well we're sleeping together so like I get you but you don't really know what's going on in inside that person's head and I think that if a man ever feels I don't know I guess a lot of time they will feel pressured especially if it's like a lad's night out to like get off with someone and go home with someone and you know have their number as high as possible and stuff that's part of their culture yeah there's a lot of pressure on men isn't there to like lose their virginity ASAP yeah like that and that must mess mess with your psyche if Mm -hmm. that's what you're doing and you know what uh defines you as a person because is anybody actually making that real connection with you or are you just sleeping with you know a different person each night yeah um and I don't and I think that that does have effects but I think it's something that people don't realize until later in life like or 
because also I was one of those people and I was like well why was I doing that what was I trying to escape from or like how was I trying to define myself was I trying to make it look like like everyone loves me or like I'm really personable or whatever so I imagine that like self-esteem or what yeah yeah it's like who were who were you trying to appease by going out and doing that every night Mm. not that I was out every night (laughs) (laughs) no judgment from me um (laughs) as as well I think there's you have to think about the fact that some people just aren't really that interested Mm -hmm. and then there's still the pressure to go and do it it's like well you know they might they might just you know some people have lower drives or it could be a you could be asexual and you're just not interested and people are like like, this is the thing that you have to do it's like I don't want to I want to do other things instead (laughs) yeah and I think that I think it's like two sides of the coin for women it's you're meant to get married and have a kid and for men you're meant to sleep with as many people as possible to define you as your gender whatever that is um, and I think, you know, men go, oh, I could never sleep with a woman who's slept with as many people as me. And it's like, well. But you slept with but, that many. <laughs> yeah. And like, for my answer to that is why, what opinion do you have of yourself then for doing that? Yeah, that's because a good point. that's the opinion that you're going to have of me, what are you thinking about yourself? And that's something that you need to look at. That's not my issue. I have my own issues with, uh, with that, but I'm not going to project that onto other people. Mm. No, exactly. Kind of as an offshoot to festivals and stuff. Um, You're into the heavy music scene. You're into the Mm -hmm. pop scene. Mm -hmm. But you also, I remember you saying, because I was talking about this with somebody else, and it was was a good point, um, was that you really like rap as well. Mm -hmm. So this kind of ties into another question I kind of have, which is like, the difference in gender, um, I don't know exactly what I mean, the difference in gender, I want to say maybe treatment or balance in different genres and why. And do you know, this may be restating the same thing, do you notice differences between subgenres or bands slash artists that have women in them or are women on the gender balance of the audience or the fan base? Yeah, definitely. Well, even just down to rap, if, um, you know, all of 50 Cent songs are misogynistic <laughs> and, um, and you know, he has sexual allegation case against him and he's like, he used to be one of the biggest rappers. And then you have the like wet ass pussy and everyone's like, oh my God, you can't say that. And it's like, well, he's talking about like slapping a bitch and turning her into a prostitute. Well, so, how many songs does Eminem have where he talks about beating women and killing women? Raping his mum. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but... But at the same time, I think one thing that, because I love rap and if there is an artist where um, you're like, well, that definitely is your life. Like Snoop Dogg, not a gangster at all, but one of the best gangster rappers of all time, in (laughs) my opinion. I love him. He's my favourite human on the planet. I don't care what anyone says. He's my (laughs) favourite. I don't know much about him, but he does seem cool from what I've seen. Oh, he's the best I love him I remember he tweeted <laughs> about like him and Martha Stewart and he was like one of the one of the people in this picture has a criminal record and it's not me <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the thing like but his songs are all you know gangster raps and he was one of the pioneers of gangster rap and when that first came so I one of my things that I love um and that I love studying at college and uni um and if I was going to teach it would be how um how music is like does life imitate art or art is imitating life and with things like NWA um when fuck the police came out people were burning their records and they were completely boycotting them and they had the FBI closing down their shows being like you can't do this Mm -hmm. and then that video of Rodney King being beaten up um was released and then everyone was like fuck the police (laughs) and you know then you get people like Pink who released um Dear Mr President Mm. and stuff and that's like throughout history you always have these like protest songs or you have these songs that people are doing to kind of like inspire I mean Pink is brilliant at that yeah Um, she's really good she's got very good attitude for like with the pop yeah yeah, and with Pink because she's so good at what she does but she has to lean more into that tomboy thing because she's 
not going to be the girly girl. Mm. Um, so that's with the you know, where you sit in the music industry. You're either a girl or a boy, or you're going to be that and you're going to fit into this box because you're, we don't know where to put anyone who's kind of in between. Yeah. But there's definite, um, definite, definite gender biases in the music industry for, you know, people like Lewis Capaldi when he came out and people are like, oh my gosh, this man singing ballads is incredible. And it's a shock because it's mainly women that you hear do that kind of thing. Yeah. But then when you have um, in rap, there's, very little female rappers mm-hmm. um, and I must say that I do have a gender bias I, I just find male rappers um I find it more aesthetically pleasing to my ear just because I think they hit harder but then I'm also very fussy with rap I only really listen to like 80s 90s gangster rap so <laughs> <laughs> there, weren't, there weren't that many women there no obviously but there's not. been there's been women who have done um you know, interviews with NWA and stuff like that. And one of them ended up being hit by Dr. Dre and there was this whole case against them. And people like Tupac have got, um, you know, he was in prison for gang raping a woman. And then everyone's Is that what like, he was oh. in prison for? Yeah. I knew he was in prison. I didn't know what it was actually for. And people are adamant that he didn't do it. And people like R. Kelly, well, how can he do it? He's oh, so talented. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, well... That makes it easier for him to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, I think it's... Um, especially with rap and hip-hop, R&B, sometimes metal, you know, it it's a violent genre. Mm. So when people are aware that you're basically living this character of a human when those things come out it's like oh but that's not actually him like that's not like he's not that person singing those songs and it's like yeah yeah they say that about Eminem don't they but it's like those ideas are coming from somewhere yeah and And he feels comfortable singing them even if he's singing them behind this thing yeah and I think Eminem has been one (laughs) of those people who's been very honest where he's like I wrote these songs through trauma I've had these thoughts of my mum because she was sedating me as a child and he's being very honest like this comes from a very real place which is why I think I love his music so much because even though it is violent and there are definitely songs that I won't listen to by him because I just find it too too much too intense <laughs> but other songs like that he did like clean out my closet is just yeah. one of the best songs of all time yeah, no, I, I, like, I agree. I actually, re- I do really like a lot of his stuff. It's just, it's one of those things where you kind of have to, and we shouldn't have, this is my problem with rap personally, is similar to yours, is that you kind of have to cherry pick what you can listen to and actually feel good about yourself listening to it. Yeah. Because there's only so much that I can excuse, like, I'm like, right, okay, he he says, he says faggot and clean out my closet, but fine, like, not fine, but you know what I mean, like, yeah, and it was, it was a different time, etc. Exactly, I think that's, um, <laughs> now is the time that people are holding everyone accountable, like, even YouTubers and stuff, the amount of apology videos, because they're like, oh, I said this racist thing, and, like, I love the makeup industry and beauty gurus and stuff but almost every single one of them has said something racist and Mm -hmm. my thing with cancel culture is you're what is the point in calling someone out if you're not giving them the opportunity to change and if you're not taking the actions that they've done (laughs) since then if they continue to be a racist bigoted I was gonna say I think the problem is when they don't really show any genuine change isn't it yeah how can you want change in the world but don't give people the opportunity to change that's my thing is that there's got to be a reason for calling people out on this yeah because and yeah some people will never change and again if someone has done racist homophobic sexist things and people want them to apologize because it's a new generation that are now consuming that content Mm. then they need to make that apology again they can't be like oh go back to this video then they need to realize that that you put that out into the world whether it's music films but it's also things like does that mean that we can't listen to Michael Jackson's music or read Harry Potter and you know it's going to come to a point where we can't consume any kind of content anymore but you have to realize what it's 
given you personally like I cannot stand JK Rowling anymore because it, no. she's being educated that's the difference it's really upsetting as well because it does taint it for you reading it exactly and she's being called out and she's rather than apologizing oh she's not sorry (laughs) yeah she's fully lent into that like in a weird way I do respect that she didn't pretend to be sorry if she wasn't but she should be sorry (laughs) yeah she should be she shouldn't be making writing a book about a trans someone like that's that's behavior that you're like well I can't support you but the thing the is time, as well like nobody fucking asked <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly it's not even like anybody asked her opinion she just willingly gave it all yeah. the time yeah and it, it's one of those things where like for me like and I know for so many other people especially like I know um a couple of trans people who when they were younger Harry Potter was their escape yeah and this is like really disappointing for them and I 100% yeah, I understand imagine. that yeah and what I said to them I was like right well if you want to watch Harry Potter illegally download it yeah don't give it don't give her the money you already yeah. have the books so she every time you re- so it's like with Jeffree Star everybody was selling their eyeshadow <coughs> palettes and I've spent a lot of money on his eyeshadow palettes I'm not selling them I'm not giving away he doesn't get paid every single time I use that eyeshadow no, palette exactly. if I upload a picture onto Instagram I'm not going to tag him I'm not going to promote that I'm using his product mm. but I well, shouldn't yeah you already to... own it the only yeah you're only going to screw yourself over if you get rid of it that's exactly yeah. the same with like I absolutely I used to really love the band brand new and it I've got like some of their vinyls and some of their cds and it came out about um allegations against the singer about dating I think she was 15 I don't know if he was dating her or if he was just being like inappropriate I don't know exactly what the details were because I didn't care to know I was like oh he's been gross Mm. I don't even want to give him the clicks of finding out what he did um but getting rid of those vinyls isn't going to I could sell them and make some money sure Mm -hmm. but nobody's going to want to buy them (laughs) at this point either so it the only thing that would get rid of them for me is to literally like throw them away or whatever but then that's my money yeah. gone <laughs> I've already paid for them exactly and I think <clears throat> that was one so I try especially now I try not to get in Facebook arguments and stuff but there are definite things like I've said to you there because there'll be people who'll be like so why do you still support Jeffree Star and I say it's not necessarily that I support him but like I said if you want to call someone out on their behavior and they refuse to change then I'm not going to support them Mm. but if you call them out on their behavior and it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to change overnight because these are also fully grown men and women who are you know being bigoted and yeah and it does take time to change but that doesn't mean that yeah even if you want to it takes time to unlearn certain stuff yeah and like if there's stuff in my personality and there definitely has been stuff in my personality in the past that hasn't always put me in the most positive light and people have called me out on it and I've made efforts to change that and stuff nothing bigoted obviously Mm. just me being a bitch to people (laughs) but I mean (laughs) we are we're products of environments like you Mm -hmm. you're taught a certain thing and if nothing challenges that for a long time exactly how are you supposed to know it's wrong Yeah, and I was saying to Emily yesterday that I've had conversations with Tories and people (laughs) who voted for Brexit, and they said, oh, I'm actually shocked that I could have a conversation with someone who's, like, extremely left-wing like you. And I was like, I'm only extremely left-wing because of my experiences in my life, and the reason why I'm so anti-Tory is because they want to... They've always voted against gay rights, they've always voted against women's rights. My dad is sick, and they're taking everything away from him. NHS, So. Exactly. So if, if you have not had my experiences and you've grown up right wing living in a countryside where everybody is Tory and you're not actually seeing it, your life isn't being affected by the policies that they're slowly implementing, then yeah. of course you're going to have that opinion and you're not going to see it as you're just going to see people arguing on the computer without any actual this is where I'm coming from. Yeah. And I can respect that people are Tories I can respect that people have different political I views <laughs> well uh, I respect that no, people can have those opinions if they haven't had any exposure to anything else yeah if you then have a conversation with someone and go well do you realize that this is what they're actually doing that is yeah because sometimes 
most people don't know everything that the, the parties that they supposedly yeah. support stand for especially older generations because or like boomers and up because the Tory party that they were voting for 20 years ago is not the Tory party that they're voting for now the same yeah. as Labour isn't that's true and you know it's you can't be like oh well I've always been this person because we have new technology but life is completely different yep social expectations change yeah and like uh, me and Emily watched um, The Social Dilemma about <clears throat> Facebook and everything yesterday on Netflix, really good. Um, and we were saying, you know, these people who are making the laws now, they were already really far ahead in their careers before technology was even a thing or the technology that we have now was even a thing. So they're not going to understand the laws. They're not. So things like the Snooper Charter or um, there was a girl who fought for... Um, upskirting to be banned oh yeah speakers. yeah I remember and there, was people, there were people who were genuinely against that and it's like and we're saying that that isn't sexual assault and it's like but, but yes. how, <laughs> and, yeah and I, I think um what is it they they said on this thing yesterday that um critics are the ones who um make change mm-hmm. you don't get anywhere without the critics but and like it's stupid of us to go oh well this worked then so it's going to work now of course it's not going to work now and it didn't even work that, then <laughs> it just got brushed aside yeah I think that's why it's always empowering seeing um women get into stuff because you know it's, it has only really been the last what 15 20 years where women will be the top in industries or yes. you know actually being listened to and we're not the ones making the tea and sending the emails booking them in being like welcome go and speak with all the men yeah now it's like no, you all listen to me. <laughs> and it's even like within the last, like say our mum's lifetimes and our lifetimes that the real big changes have happened as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's why sometimes it's a little bit frustrating for our generation because we sometimes can maybe feel that we are ahead of it, but realistically the world hasn't caught up to what we're thinking and especially what younger generations are thinking. No, I totally agree. It's I understand that it's tough as well for people who lived a certain way for so long. Mm-hmm. It's hard, especially when you're just dealing with your own stuff as well. It is hard to keep up with these changes. But it's yeah, not and I think once you know it's not difficult, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think it must be hard for them as well to hear like your way of doing things is wrong and damaging to other people um, and that's not okay and I'm not going to be treated that way Um, you have to respect me the same way that you you don't get to be entitled anymore sorry (laughs) yeah exactly I'm the entitled one because I know that like millennials are meant to be the most (laughs) entitled generation and stuff but I think it's just we're we're asking for just equality at the very base level and just for respect and, yeah you know it's already hard enough for like our generations and underneath like we can't afford houses like, we're going into the second biggest recessions or the biggest recession since the great depression and we've had two mm. in our lifetime yeah. that most generations have never had that and exactly you know, I was people can't I was thinking about how like we're entitled apparently but then like in the 70s you could buy a house on minimum wage you know exactly like I was saying to my mum because she bought a house when she was 23 and I was like well how much is that so she told me but I was like you know them calculators that you do from like the 80s to now how much (laughs) that is worth and we were in a restaurant and I genuinely almost started crying (laughs) because I was like (laughs) I was like I can't believe that you that you were able to buy a house like that I wouldn't because that house now as well because she knew what the address was it's still just you know like a one bedroom house that you know we would probably all be renting out as a multiple occupancy house now for like 700 pounds a month but that even now is worth something like 150,000 and it's like how if she bought that for like 20 like how is that fair what the fuck I know I know ridiculous and it's like, I think why, it's, why don't you have your millennials aren't by <laughs> killing the housing industry? No, no, yeah, the housing industry it, is killing the housing industry by putting the prices up so fucking high. 
Yeah, and it's also, it's harder for us to get to that level of success anyway because the retirement age keeps on going up. So yeah. because the retirement age is going up, people aren't retiring, so there isn't, like, we're expected at our job to leave university and have 10 years worth of experience for us to even be considered yeah. for a role. And it's like, well, how, I can't, A, I'm not old enough to do that. And I was eight years old. <laughs> yeah, I was eight years old when I first started. <laughs> but yeah. it's like, how, how are you expecting us to make this career progression? And especially when, you know, there's already our age, we have stigma because of our age, because we're women, because we're queer you know we have everything that's been thrown against us which to be honest to me gives me more um motivation to do it fueled by spite <laughs> yeah yeah yes. I'm like, yeah if you think I'm not gonna do it I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it better so that <laughs> you can you. come and apologize to me <laughs> yeah. I love that yeah one of the things that I was gonna mention to you as well just because it's something that I feel um passionate about because I have PMDD is the way that women are treated in a workplace no matter what industry it is mm. um, like I said if I was working on the bar I would always just have like tampons and pads with me and stuff just in case there was a girl there but if you're working on like anywhere and there's no men around that is so taboo mm-hmm. and it is emo- like it's like breathing it's like eating it's a natural thing to do we can't help it and it's one of those things where if you do bring it up, people are then, it can be used as a tool against you. Yeah. Uh, or as a tool not to respect you or mm-hmm. it's something that people take the piss out of for you. And I always, that's also one of the things that I um, embarrass people around because I'm like, why does that bother you so much? But there's definitely, you notice men who are being raised by women. Yeah have a completely different yeah. um, outlook on that so luckily the last two places that I've worked in um the guys that I've been around who have like I've had girlfriends for years or they've been raised by like their nans aunties and mum and that has just been so much more of a positive environment for me because if I was feeling a little bit hormonal the chefs would like bring me flowers and chocolate oh. and be like are you okay and I'm like thank you oh. or they'll be like <laughs> Like they'd see me get a little bit stressed and sometimes it's not always easy for me to control it as much as I can. Mm. But they'll be like, oh, do you want to come outside for a minute? And they'll put someone else on the bar and they'll just give me a hug while I have a quick cry and then go back in. (laughs) And that's such a better way. And then there's been places where I'm like, I can't even talk to them about it. And that makes it so much worse because you're already feeling like, especially with PMDD, like you can't control it. And when you're trying to control it because other people around you don't feel comfortable because they're men, mm. that by the time I get home, I'm completely drained and I'll be crying for days because I've had to like suppress it. Yeah. And it's stuff where it is now registered <laughs> by the World Health Organization as a disability, but it's always something that I'm very... I hold back going into any job telling them because it's something that could get me fired if I'm like, oh, I need to take a couple of days off or, oh, I'll be back in a minute. I'm just going to go cry for 20 minutes. Um, yeah. And it shouldn't be something that women get fired for. No. But it happens it's, it's, to so so many women. It's like every any other health issue, ongoing health issue, you know, that's something that your workplace should cater to. Not, not mm-hmm. You know what I mean. If you're good at your job and you're qualified at it and they really want you they should make those um what's the word I'm looking for accommodations accommodations Accommodations. yeah that's it thank you Emily (laughs) 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 no it's I mean I think uh, it's a bit of a tangent but I feel like this whole work from home thing as well has really shone a light on like ableist attitudes in workplaces because there are plenty of people especially with again with like chronic illnesses or whatever who would be able to do so much better if they could work from home and it's yeah. one of those things of like it's become really abundantly clear how actually it's been quite easy to do a lot of these things to support disabled workers and yeah. they just haven't wanted to clearly yeah, so I'm hoping exactly. that's something that that is addressed once people start properly going back to work. 
Yeah, yeah, I, th- I think it will be. I think that this has definitely been, uh, it's the first time the entire world has been put into the same situation and it's not mm. like, like during World Wars and everything, obviously there was a lot of places getting bombed, but there was also a lot of places that couldn't relate to it, whereas everyone in the world is relating to this and, you know, you don't think it's that hard to just stay at home. But I know that so many people, their priorities have been shifted and it's also been a time where there's been a lot of uncomfortable conversations I think the good majority of people will want to ignore yeah um, and they haven't been given the chance to ignore it um which I think is good and I think with um you know with sexism in the workplace maybe it'll get a bit easier because if people are doing a full-time job and they have kids being like mummy 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 and they can see that this woman is you know doing an incredible job whilst raising a family and staying at home during a pandemic and men of course I think it'll just kind of shift people's perceptions on people I think I well I hope that it makes people respect each other a little bit more but I don't know if that's always (laughs) the case Mm, no I know exactly what you mean and speaking of like say working mums um I think that's really good in the sense of, say, I think we talked about this a little bit um, when I was chatting to Emily, but how a lot of kids might not realise or see their mum based on her career, if that makes sense. So, like, I think a lot of people see it as, like, dad works, mum does all the house stuff, even if she works as well. They might categorise her as a mum first and then kind of ignore the fact that actually she might be really successful at her job. I think yeah, well, the work at home thing lets kids see mum working. Yeah, definitely. And <laughs> me and Ben kind of had this, my brother had this conversation recently because um, when we were growing up, I mean, dad got ill when I was quite young. I was about seven or eight. Um, but before then, dad was, um, you know, a big, CEO of like um, a company for tech company and he was like the director of like all of Europe Scandinavia England and he would be flown around all of Europe to do um speeches and like to do this job and he was like the businessman and then when he got sick mum was like looking after me and Ben looking after my dad and then started her own company as well and is performing and everything and Ben turned around to me and he was like, you know, I only realised recently that, like, like dad is the idiot and mum is the badass. <laughs> I was like, well, what do you mean? He was like, it's not that I ever thought that mum was an idiot, but mum was the mum. Mm. And she did a very good job of looking after us, but I was always, because I was going to the choir with my mum and I was watching her do this from a young age and have, you know, little to no training in running the choir or music or anything when she first started and she wasn't expecting that many people to turn up on the first night and stuff um so to me I've always seen her as incredibly strong like she is the strongest human I know the bravest one of the most talented people I know um and that's just always been probably my main driving force for well look at everything we've gone through and my mum's still being able to raise my family and even though her and my dad aren't there aren't together anymore she's still there all the time to support him and then supports everyone in her so I, I've had so many people in the choir turn around to me and like say to me that my mum has changed their life and that um I've had two people tell me that they wouldn't be here if my mum wasn't here because just having the choir has given them that support and love and that's just such an I think I was about 14 15 when someone's told me someone told me that from a choir and that's just such a such a badass thing to hear about your mum because you're like and then it's also really touching and inspiring to be like well I know everything that's going on at home and she's still able to go out and work like that perform like that yeah so I think that's always been for me like it doesn't matter what's going on just you can still do what you want to and you just need to put it in different boxes Mm. really and I think that's one thing with women is um you know maybe we're a little bit more resilient in ways than we can choose to be like oh this is work and this is home 
Mm. Yeah, I, I feel like we have to compartmentalize a lot of things. Because <laughs> like mm-hmm. you said, like even stuff like what you said before, if you're having to say, think about leaving a job that you really, really love because of a toxic environment, for example, that's not something, I mean, obviously that's something that can affect men too, but if the toxic environment is sexism. Yeah, exactly. And I think that um, <clears throat> if I have been in a toxic environment for work, and it has been something to do with sexism, <laughs> then I always try and call them out on it first and be like, listen, I'm going to leave because of this. So you can either sort out the problem or I'm gone. Mm-hmm. And there's definitely been times where they've just chosen because maybe they've known the man longer um, to keep the man and let me go, which I'm like, well, that's just going to turn around and bite you on the arse. Because he's going to do this to someone else, yeah. It gives people the opportunity to change, but if they don't, um, I'm there to call them out once, but I'm not going to, I'm not there to completely change people. If they don't want to change it, then I'm just yeah. going to leave them for the club into the best. You're not their therapist. <laughs> Yeah, not your job. Like you, yeah, like I, like you said. Um, sometimes calling people out is just to be to feel elitist or whatever. But a lot of the time, it is like I'm calling you out because it's going to help you in the future. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And like, because I have, um, <laughs> sorry, because I have a lot of management experience and stuff. I always find it shocking when managers don't want to make that environment better for their staff and yeah my, my big thing um managing like 30 people remotely um everybody works completely differently and everyone is going to be motivated and demotivated by different things so there is a level of you need to treat people individually and realize that one person's issue isn't necessarily an issue for everybody else Mm. but if you notice a trend why aren't you doing anything to change that because if at the end of the day even if you're an owner of a bar and your only motivation is to make profit because you're hiring young staff who are going to be changing every two years if your only motivation is profit you're not going to listen to people's grievances about the environment but if your motivation is to create the best workplace and keep your staff there and keep people motivated and keep people happy then you need to make those changes yeah and And accommodate people that is the word yes (laughs) and fostering loyalty as well can just benefit you in so many ways and it doesn't take especially in the sort of working environment that we're all used to just making those little accommodations and those little things putting that effort in can really really endear an employee to you yeah yeah the way that they're going to go above and beyond to help you or they're going to stand by you in a way if they need to yeah well Rebecca at work because we all know my brain's a bit weird um once she kind of sussed right okay Emily works differently she'd give me tasks that were primarily walking around and doing stuff because I don't want to just sit you there. You needed and, that stimulation. So she'd be like, oh, Emily, can you set up blah, 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 blah. Mm. Whereas this guy has, his tactic is to get everybody to do the things at the same time. But today I was like, can I do the setups? And he's like, just you? I was like, yeah, yeah. So today was my day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> That's Love a it. good thing. Like what I've just done, um, I mean, it's not music related, but um, the job that I'm at now, what I'm doing is... Um, I have to do one-to-ones with them every week. And what I've done is say to them, yeah, I'm managing you all as a team, but also at the same time, I'm managing you individually. So you guys know what I expect from you Mm. um, as the staff, but what do you expect from me as a manager? Mm. And like, is there anything that is going on in your life where you think that there's sometimes there's going to be that you need more support because it's better for you to communicate me because I can help you work around it and if you need to leave for whatever reason you'll have to have an unpaid day but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fire you for it Mm. so it has to be and then people are really really receptive then to you and then people as long as people feel that they can talk to me about their issues even if 
I can't sort it out for them, then at least they have that communication and they feel that they're supported. And that was my main thing with everybody working from home and having such a big team is that they feel personally supported and supported as a team. Yeah. So, which I don't think a lot of other people do. Like I de- I definitely didn't have that when I was at uh, the job I was just at and trying not to say names so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I think, again, we said this before, that the importance of communication in management is crazy and it's insane how many managers don't realize the importance of communication yeah and I think that what a lot of managers or a lot of managers that I've had they take feedback is criticism yeah it's not and sometimes it is a criticism but like I'll never go to a manager to be like oh you're doing this wrong I'll be like have you tried thinking about it this way or could we try this way we'll still get the same outcome but the productivity is going to be a lot better yeah criticism isn't always spiteful critique Mm -hmm. is is there for you to be able to improve yeah and I know that I have had jobs in bars where I suggested something and the owners have said no and then the guy manager suggests the same thing and they say yeah and I (sighs) don't even get me started (laughs) the amount of times and like literally it would happen and then it would happen straight away like I would suggest something they'd be like no and then the other manager would be like oh well why didn't he would word it differently and they'd be like that's the best thing and I'm like I know it is (laughs) I've had that happen to me like on a personal level of either like recommending things like tv or or music or whatever to people or you know giving certain advice um I used to have a friend who's a guy obviously and I've given him advice of something to do. I can't remember anything specific. Um, it might have been about clothing or something. And he didn't follow that advice. And then I was, he's, he knows my dad. I think he quite looks up to my dad. So I was like, Dad, can you tell him this? He will listen if you say to do it. And I don't know if that's a, a, a role model thing or a sexism thing. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, like I said uh, about working at festivals, when the initial thing was uh, putting us over onto cash was a sexism thing, but then we had to realise that that's kind of actually to our advantage. Yeah. That if I realise that I am in a workplace that I can't leave where there is sexism, then rather than me just getting myself wound up every time and me telling them to do something and then getting the male manager to do it, I would just be like, or do you want to suggest this to them? Because I know that they're not going to listen to me, but I think it'll be good for the business. So you have to kind of choose whether it's the battle of it being your idea or whether it, the outcome is what you want. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a tricky one to balance sometimes, isn't it? Especially, say, if you're trying to make a good impression for possible mm-hmm. promotions or opportunities. N- having good ideas that aren't being either taken seriously or credited to you Mm -hmm. can be detrimental yeah like have you seen that um what is that film Mm -hmm. and it's about the women mathematicians and engineers who hidden figures yes yes that is such a good film yeah and these are like not just women these are like black women in the 60s and they weren't doing it to be like I was the one to do it they were doing it for the love of science and getting people to the moon and and they were doing it by hand yeah yeah I know like it's just incredible and like it's kind of sad that you know you have to wait decades for these (laughs) things to come out and be like oh that's actually who did it and but it's nice that we're getting to a time where recognition is being given to people who deserve it yeah definitely we've kind of talked about this a little bit but um if you wanted to go into more detail or any other examples but have you ever been made to doubt your abilities or your place in a music environment because of your gender yeah (laughs) yeah I know that um quite a young age so like I said because mum was doing all of her music stuff and she um had this piano player um keyboard player who used to perform with her in the choir and he used to play um with um one of the guys who used to own Park Street Studios and I was just at college and um 
mum was recording in there a couple of times and they were like oh do you want to come do like an internship it was like all free and all, it was basically me just sending invites out to people a lot of the time but then I would also get to go sit in with people and I remember a producer turning around to me once and saying to me oh I think it's right because he was probably about middle age like 50s and I remember him turning around to me saying, saying, it's so cool seeing more girls from a young age wanting to get into it rather than like falling into it because they've been like a secretary or something like that. Mm. And he was like, but I'm telling you now, you're going to have to work twice as hard. And I was like, why? And then he, and he said that he thinks music that has been produced by women is better because he thinks that we have a better ear. And he's like, but the industry doesn't see you that way. And they're going to try and like either discount you or like try and turn you into something that you're not and that was you know it was like good advice to get at that point of me wanting to go into things but then it was also like a oh right okay I didn't realize that this is how it's going to be and then I think me and Emily have said before that we've both been doing live sound before and without fail every single time <laughs> If I'm at a venue, even if I'm just doing like karaoke or something, if I'm there with a mixer, some guy will come over who goes, oh, I have a guitar amp and I'm like, I have a degree. And then they're like, oh, calm down. And I'm like, I don't, the thing is, is you're drunk. Mm. Like, I'm getting paid to be here. And like, I know what I'm doing. This is my equipment that I bought from my home. Yeah. Like, because there is, I shout at them like that when they start touching stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, it sounds like that. And I'm like, I know it sounds like that. That's why I'm here. I'm sorting it out to start sounding like that. And they have to be like, like, I know one guy, I mean, the thing is, they're drunk a lot of the time. They're like, oh, do you not like accepting help from men? Are you gay or something? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, yes I, to I both. Like, kind of, but that's got nothing to do with it. Like, you're about to spoil your pint over really expensive equipment yeah. and you you don't know what you're doing like go away and but that happens every time like if every time I'm doing live sound and that put me off because that's what I wanted to do I didn't really like being in the studio I like doing all the live sound stuff um but that just put me off was every single time I was behind a desk people would just come over and start taking over and I'm like just leave me alone so that's why I was happy that I found events management because that was right at the end of our college um that that guy came in to talk about um being a tour manager mm. and I had applied to go to university but I had lost all faith in the music industry because I was like I don't really like music production and going into events is just like mm. that side there's just so much sexism so much like doubt because people won't want you to like set up the equipment people are think that you don't know what you're doing and it was yeah. just every single time that it was it's the like, added fight so of having what? to battle against that when you're just trying to do your damn job but you exactly. know you can do. like yeah and it is a tough job and like don't get me wrong I don't think I am capable of like setting up rigs on my own but neither are, neither is just one man <laughs> neither I have so, yeah neither of the people that are trying to tell you how to use your fucking mixing desk yeah yeah I also think it's funny that like the assumption as well is like you don't want to accept my help yeah they automatically assume for some reason they've jumped to this of you're not interested in me that must be it just must be that you're not interested in men at all yeah or that like what has happened in your life that you don't want to help too much of this has happened is why I don't want your help necessary help it's like, it's like yeah. listed advice yeah because also like I like I said I don't think I'm capable of setting up a rig on my own like I'm five foot nothing and I don't do weights or anything like that I know I'm weak and if I need help I will ask for it but yeah. chances are I'm probably going to ask Emily yeah <laughs> the carry stuff oh yeah <laughs> like I know my limitations and I think that that's maybe one of the big differences between men and women is knowing what your limitations are and not feeling weird for help and that's one of the good things that we get as women is it's not dehumanizing to us to ask for help mm. whereas to men a lot of the time you just can't ask for help like man up do it yourself yeah so yeah it's seen as weakness and vulnerability yeah, exactly. God forbid and, you're those things. 
exactly and like and I feel bad for people because I'm like if you want my help just ask for it because I'll do the same so don't assume that I need the help because if I need it I'll ask for it mm. so. yeah we had a similar conversation um I had a similar conversation with the girls in the band uh about I know we had a show where I think Sha came in with like her amp and her guitar and her boyfriend was just carrying her backpack and the people who said this didn't know that he was her boyfriend, but they were like, shouldn't you be carrying that to him? And it's like, well, one, you don't know who these people are to each other. Could just be a stranger who was like, I can carry that if that's... Or, you know, the reason that he... One of the reasons he wasn't carrying it was, I think he'd recently had an operation or something. Mm. Um, but also they're a really similar build. <laughs> like, it's not like he's a tense, like, rugby player looking guy. He's a, like a, bolt, a skinny beanpole man. The same that she's a skinny beanpole woman. Like they are <laughs> evenly matched. I could understand if it was say me and somebody taller and stronger looking than me. <laughs> but, you know, I'm just as capable of, I, ca- I carry my amp too because that is my equipment that I purchased knowing yeah, I would exactly. have to carry it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like... <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So my last question, and then if you've got anything that you want to add out, sorry, I've got a notification. If you've got anything you want to add after, absolutely feel free. But this is the last one in my notes. Um, What is, I guess, your opinion on uh, the importance of shows and festivals and blogs and things like that that showcase female and LGBT talent? Uh, I think it's probably the most important thing there is, I think. Education and exposure is how you make change yeah. in people. And they kind of have to go hand in hand. I think the education should maybe come first because I think if you have people who really, really aren't receptive to it and then, you know, like, you know how homophobic people freak out when it's pride and it's like, calm down, <laughs> you know, it happens every month, like just simmer down. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're freaking out because they're not educated and they yeah. have their opinion based off the stuff that they're consuming. And even though all of the content that they're consuming is falsehoods, that's what they believe. They're wired to think that way. Mm. So just exposing people to it straight away, you know, you look at things like that new advert with like black people at Christmas and everyone's being like I'm not shopping at Sainsbury's <laughs> anymore like again simmer down what is wrong with you I can't like, relate to this family you can relate yeah. to fucking carrots though exactly like it's all ridiculous but I think people genuinely do not have the right education and I think mm. that it's important definitely still to have those things like concerts that are put on by just women or you know having drag shows here and you know I'm making those people who aren't yet educated uncomfortable but the people who are educated and the people who are from those backgrounds still have you know their platform they can fully be themselves like I go to so many drag shows and it's just the best environment because there's zero judgment Mm. there and people can just fully be there to be at a show enjoy it you're not looking at somebody else over there everyone's just there for that one purpose so I always find those type of events and stuff really uplifting or, you know, listening to podcasts with people talking about what they're doing and just supporting each other mm. is incredible and important for change because that's when, you know, you can have a kid listening to these podcasts or going to these shows and they're going to be the next biggest advocate. Um, but I think that the way that we educate kids on these things now needs to change because at the end of the day it's not a social issue it's not a political issue you know women live in these worlds like minorities are people even though it's not what we think the majority is like who (laughs) cares about that and like it's it's such a small narrow-minded way to live when there's such a big and beautiful world out there and if you go looking for these things there's no negativity in those spaces so if people are educated from kids and I think it is starting now to be like you just need to accept everybody it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things yeah. then it, we won't have to focus on it so much but right now there's still real issues that are going on so even if it makes those people feel uncomfortable that's because it's still happening and you're not reading history you're looking at yeah. reality I think a lot of the problem is people are like oh you know 
you you got right you've got the right to do this or you've got the right to do this like gays can marry so that means gay rights are over it's like no there's still lots of things lots of things that are being yeah. discriminated against for the lgbt community especially in the trans community yeah and even here i think that um you know british people are very quick to be like oh it's not as bad as america but it's, that's such it's an easy way to subtler reflect. it's yeah. subtler yeah but everything we do is more subtle mm. and that doesn't mean that there aren't kids killing themselves because they're not being accepted yeah exactly and that doesn't mean that there aren't grown-ass adults fighting people because they're different like it's, it's such a neanderthal way and like tribalist way to live your life like why can't you look at someone who's different and be like that's amazing and like mm. what work the way you work and like you need to frame it in like what can we learn from each other how can we expand each other's view of the world Mm -hmm. rather than how are we different well you can think about how you're different from one another but more in like a sympathetic sense or how your experience is different from mine I was thinking about this earlier and it was in terms of I was thinking about my own music taste but I think it rings true generally anyway is that diversity is pretty much always beneficial (laughs) like what are you going to lose from knowing people who aren't like you you might not get along with them you might not be able to connect in the same way as people who are like you but at the end of the day a lot of us are more alike than we are not yeah exactly and in the like grand scheme of things like yes it's important like what people's identity they are so whether like their gender their sexuality their race anything like that is really important but when you put those things that are like personally and socially important through politics that's when it turns into a much bigger issue that's more divisive because the real issues are things like education healthcare the Mm. environment killing the planet that we're on everything like that is things (laughs) that actually matter yeah the little things that make us unique as a person is what divides us but really doesn't fucking matter no um hopefully we'll get to a place where they don't matter but I think up until that point you need to celebrate who you are around the people who are also celebrating themselves try and like block out the noise but educate the people that you come across who are bigoted like that yeah because there's some people who who can be educated and can change their mind on stuff and there's some people that it's just not worth your energy to do that with Mm -hmm. yeah um I was going to say something else as well I think there's too many people who have the attitude of if it's not a problem for me it's not a problem Mm -hmm. and I think that's a a, a, it's not strictly a conservative thing but I think that's kind of the attitude of a lot of like Tories like we said earlier because they haven't had those experiences yeah they lack the empathy to care about people who have yeah and I think people don't like to be like I the thing that I found is, is people don't like being told that they're privileged Mm. because poor people can be privileged like anyone can be privileged and I think that you know everything that's happened in lockdown and with George Floyd and stuff I think that that like was a case that shook the world because everybody was at home and it's something yeah there weren't any distractions yeah and it's something where it's like well you have to take a hold and like you have to notice you can't you're not doing anything else in the day to distract you from the news and what's going on in the world yeah Yeah, before had the whole oh you know I'm too busy with work and life and etc to deal with so, so social issues it's like well we've got time now do you want to talk yeah, and I think <laughs> because of things like social media that even though um is causing a civil war um it also gave everyday people a chance because now they're at home and they're sat there watching this happen and normally they would be and they would talk about it with their friends and their family that they're around whereas now people were on their own and they were sat down being like this is what happens to me on an everyday basis when I get on the bus when I get a taxi when you know I go out for a dinner and all their friends and colleagues who just thought oh well I know that she's okay had never actually heard what they're living like on a day-to-day basis so I think it shook people that they didn't realize that they're 
I think people knew that they were privileged, but I don't think they were realizing just how much it was still keeping people. Yeah. In that because I, again, racism. like we said earlier, a lot of people think that these things are over, like slavery is over, so racism is over. It's like, no. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's even back to like when they got. Um, when slavery ended and there were reparations that wasn't given to the slaves that was given to the people that the owners yeah what weren't given anything so oh my god when you say all slavery ended this this massive thing they weren't Mm -mm. like it ended but then they were all arrested (laughs) yeah literally that's how the police started in america don't understand the people who have Mm. those racist views that these really really right-wing people believe that the republican party and people like donald trump who's the working man's man uh bunny ears because this is a podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's in quotes yeah. <laughs> quote unquote yeah so <laughs> is he is, he masquerades himself as that and because he acts like a thug people go well that's democracy because that's what i'm like whereas other people go you don't actually see what he's doing he's destroying country i can't wait to never see that man's face ever again oh. did you see him with that tiny desk <laughs> yeah <laughs> i wish i had like the, goal. The, level, the, the, the yeah i mean the level of confidence unwarranted confidence that people like i don't want a blanket statement because it, it's not fair on a lot of straight white men but <laughs> yeah the the unwarranted confidence from so many mediocre <laughs> straight cis white men this just what I mean like, men can get up on stage and do nothing they can roll out of bed yep and like if I'm sworn <laughs> that's an entire day of me sorting myself out yeah no exactly it's yeah I think that's I think it helps in the genre that I play that mm-hmm you're not expected or like no nobody really cares uh if I'm I just go on stage in like jeans and whatever band t-shirt I'm feeling that day and it works because it's this it works in the subculture but mm-hmm. yeah Neither if I was going to go on band t-shirt and jeans <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and I also have the barrier of a guitar mm-hmm. so the focus isn't on what I'm wearing or what I look like so much as it is what I'm doing yeah and I think that's really helpful um yeah. but yeah if you just stood there as a singer and you don't have a barrier between that people and you're singing pop or ballads or more mainstream things there's definitely a lot more focus and critique on appearance which is that's why I'm a diva for no one cares about you they're looking at what I'm doing <laughs> Oh, do you know what? We were talking, I can't, I can't remember why, but we were talking about our drummer the other day and I was like, I feel kind of bad for him because one, he's the only boy in the band and I'm like, I don't know if he gets as many compliments as we do because I feel like people might feel like they need to compliment the girls more because we might not be getting that recognition, which, mm-hmm. you know, fine, I appreciate. But Ryan works really hard and he's doing the most physical thing on stage. And I really hope, I I haven't asked him and I need to, but I really hope he does get those compliments too. But we were saying it's a little bit harder because drummers kind of get, like drummers and bassists get quite overlooked anyway. Mm -hmm. And he's at the back half of the time, so people might not even see him for the whole show to recognise him. Probably in the dark. Yeah, exactly. There have been shows where he's literally been about (laughs) 10 foot back in the dark. And it's like, I feel really bad because even if people wanted to compliment the drummer, they might not have seen him to know what he looks like to compliment him. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been gigs where I'm like, who is the drummer? Because they're amazing, but I don't know. So I have to like watch them, like, you know, when they're getting off. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I do have that problem sometimes where I'm like, I'm really enjoying a band. And then for some reason, as soon as they're off stage, I don't recognise any of them to to go and tell them they were good. Yeah, Uh, then you turn around and I'm at the barbie and like, weren't they amazing? So I think that is, that does that is um, a way in which being a girl in a band can be beneficial because people are more likely to recognise you and be like, that was the girl from the band because mm-hmm. you might be the only girl there that night or your your band might be the only girls there that night. Yeah. So there is benefit there as long as as long as the compliments are genuine. 
<laughs> yeah. We covered a lot, didn't we? It's really hard not to trash men when you talk like <laughs> <laughs> no I mean I try I, I do try to be fair about it because obviously there there's so many things going on that are unfair to both sides mm-hmm. um especially things like like we said like men being made to play down their emotions or repress them and yeah. mental health stuff and all that it is taken so much less seriously with men um yeah and it's really unfortunate and I think- any sexist man is going to have a lot of mental health issues because if they're that focused on a woman as a woman and a man as a man, they, they're they trying to live up to a certain way themselves, which yeah. is really Trying to fit a certain role, absolutely. And you as, as, as well, if they have sexist views about women, they probably have sexist views about men. Yeah. In terms of things like, you know, I have to be macho and I have to... Mm-hmm people have to see me this way and if I do something else Mm -hmm. that might make me seem weak (laughs) you know (laughs) really stereotypical I'm being obviously I think I get I mean I still get really angry and frustrated um with certain things now but I'm in a life where I'm like right okay well why are they thinking like that and it's not Mm -hmm. necessarily me trying to understand them to get where they're coming from it's just like I need to know why you feel this way because yeah. maybe there's a chance that we could change that mm. yeah I think it's again it's I think it's um more of a widespread sort of awareness of sociology and psychology and the way certain things can impact and manifest and uh, and the awareness of things like the, s- the social roles and conditioning Mm-hmm. Because we're all sort of starting to be so much more aware of that. We're starting to unpack and unpick these things. Mm-hmm. And starting to zero in on like, oh, you know, that could be a result of this and this. So maybe, I mean, most of the time the answer is therapy. <laughs> yeah. But men are shamed for seeking therapy, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's a, I think both on, both on like a personal level um, and also like, a social level how how are you meant to grow if you're suppressing something so Mm -hmm. if society is suppressing minorities how are they meant to grow and flourish and how is society meant to change Mm -hmm. and if you're also like suppressing parts of yourself how are you ever meant to get to where you want to be in life because you're not living it in the best way yeah absolutely I think it's got to be stuff that people do work on on themselves but also try and do that with other people as well to make other people change yeah and I think the thing is with these attitudes as well is they don't just affect the person like it's one thing if you if you have sort of harmful habits or anything like that that only affect you but if you're sexist that's going to affect your wife your daughter Mm -hmm. the people Mm -hmm. around you and then that's going to have an effect like your daughter will then have to overcome those views she grew up in that environment with you thinking that way and and acting on those thoughts so yeah yeah and I think that you know there's people like us where if we're put in that situation we're like well no I'm going to prove it the other way but there's I would say a good majority of people if you're being told all of your life that you're one thing and you can only achieve that one thing and that's all you're gonna you might believe it yeah yeah absolutely I think that you could do anything else if you've always been told that you can't yeah that's you Exactly, yeah. There are some people who are victim to the whole system that don't even realise that there is another option or Mm -hmm. that there's anything wrong with it. And it's not even necessarily like purposeful ignorance. It's just they've not been shown there is another, (laughs) that there's another option, basically. Yeah. I think things like that, like it... (laughs) It is starting to change, but right now, as quickly as everything is changing, there's as much uh, kickback as well. So I would say for every like one person pushing the boundaries, whether it's for women, LGBT, uh, you know, people of colour, there's a hundred people telling them why they shouldn't be mm-hmm. achieving that. So I think there's still definitely a fight, and it's it's great to see, you know, younger kids getting involved in rallies and stuff. It's crazy to see that because they. You know, and that's, I would say, a good part of that is social media. Yeah. Because kids are exposed to things that we were never exposed to. 
yeah they <laughs> they grew up on it in the way that we didn't I think no yeah I think being like but that's not okay yeah I absolutely love the attitude of of young of um I don't really know what age frame it is but I've just seen so many examples of people younger than me who just are not putting up with this shit and it's great because the sort mm-hmm. of stuff that we we probably either put up with or didn't realize was even wrong when we were in school kids yeah. now are like no no that's not okay and I'm like I'm proud of you yeah. I don't know you yeah. but I'm proud of you <laughs> yeah because it's now like I reckon like people who are like bullying people for that are the ones who end up being like they're not popular anymore mm. they're like well you're the arsehole yeah yeah there seems to be a lot more of like empathy with the mm-hmm. younger generation which I love yeah um and I think it probably helps as well that I think there's kind of less stigma to there's like there's one that's like more of a blend of subcultures and mm-hmm. there's less stigma about being part of subcultures as well like in the way that maybe goths or or like the Grebo kids <laughs> were bullied yeah um yeah. I think now it's just like goth is like fashion (laughs) emo is fashion yeah yeah I mean like I wish all the like goth and emo clothes we had when we were young because they look so good now I'm like I would actually start dressing like that like that aesthetic is so good yeah so but and it's okay to do it now (laughs) yeah yeah and I think there's the stigma is going as well about speaking up about things as well which I think is also really helpful Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely like it's just you know kids are taught from like an easy like a younger age like it's okay to talk to me if you're upset like why are you upset it's not like stop crying or like because I told you so like I'm an adult like it's no this we talk about it because of this so yeah and I I just think that social media is such a bad thing but also a brilliant thing but yeah again it's it's toxic but it's also incredible for yeah for so Um, many other reasons kids are now raised with social media and that's just you know a fact of life they can all use social media and an ipad before they can talk and before they can read and write in fact i think it's actually teaching kids to be able to read at a younger age before they can talk which is weird like technology is a great it's given a platform isn't it and a voice to people who wouldn't yeah. have it before. yeah exactly um so i just wanted to thank you sammy for helping me out for a start and thank you for your time and thank you for your thoughts. It was very interesting. I love hearing what other pe- what people think about all of this stuff because I've lo- I've asked a lot of people the same questions. I add in a few that are more specific to people, but it's really great hearing people's different answers. Um, and I feel like you're quite a wise woman, Sammy, and I like to hear what you have to say. So oh, <laughs> thank you for gracing nice. me with your thoughts. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think it's always really lovely to just it's not very often that you get the opportunity to sit down with a friend one-on-one especially a friend that you don't get to see that often and yeah talk about experiences that we both kind of lived like parallel I guess but never experienced it together at the same time yeah I think that's that that's part of what's really interesting as well because we grew up in different places as well mm-hmm. And yeah, knowing that we have some of that overlap is like, okay, well, there's definitely something going on here that isn't just me or isn't just where I live. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really good to get that sort of perspective from different people Mm -hmm. to see where those overlaps are. (laughs) So yeah, thanks, Sammy. It was great to have you.